I appreciate everyone coming here for a uh, specially called meeting of the Public Works Committee. Um, back during the budget process, uh, Mr. Scott Potter had talked about uh, talking to the council and talking to um, the community about the United, about uh, flood preparedness and some of the projects and some of the plans that are going on with that. So um, following up with that and going along with what Mr. Potter um, pledge to do and also um, something that I'd ask for him to do as well, particularly after the uh, flooding in Houston and really the increased weather that we're having, um, not just um, as far as hurricanes, but flood events um, around the country. Um, and whether, no matter what you think of what the causes are, the, um, we're having a lot more of them. And in Nashville, of course, we had the large 2010 flood, but we've had other ones even recently, uh, a few months ago, the um, Whites Creek um, overflowed and there were people that had to evacuate. So we're having a lot more uh, flooding events. And personally, I think that means we need to invest a lot more in our flood infrastructure and take a lot more active role in um, home buyouts and that kind of thing. And potentially also, uh, the downtown flood wall, which all this Mr. Potter will get into. And I know we've got a lot going on on our plate as far as uh, the soccer stadium, transit, um, Cloud Hill, and many other things, short-term rentals. And so I figured let's throw one more thing on there that's not as complicated. Um, but um, we don't get to pick the issues that come before us, and this is something we raise the stormwater fee, and uh, that way, and we're making a lot more investments with that. Um, and this goes along with that: stormwater, flooding, um, all these kind of things that uh, help our city when it rains a lot. So um, this is the time I think to start talking about our flood preparedness and how we're investing in our flood infrastructure and dealing with it. And it's not something I think we can um, put off. Um, because you never know when there might be a spring day or a summer day and all of a sudden we get 15 inches in a localized area and you have firefighters you know, pulling people out of houses in Whites Creek or Madison or wherever it might be or um, Seven Mile Creek down in my district. So I'm going to turn over to Mr. Potter. You've, I'll let you take the mic and uh, Mr. Cole and y'all introduce who you've got with you and I'll turn it over to y'all. So I'm, um, thank you, Chairman. We really appreciate the chance to be here. Um, I'm Eric Cole, and I'm the new guy in this discussion um, as the Chief Resilience Officer for the city. And I know several of you asked when we announced the, the new office and our work, just what exactly is resilience? Um, I think tonight's a pretty good example of, of, of what it is. Um, as we've kind of gotten started on this work, you know, this is, uh, two-year strategic process that uh, the Rockefeller Foundation's uh, named Nashville one of 100 resilient cities. Um, but we've talked to folks about what they think, you know, what is resilience. And, and I think certainly to uh, some folks, as we're going to discuss tonight, it's natural uh, community resilience after natural disasters, after infrastructure failures, and, and even are we prepared for tragic events like we've seen in Las Vegas. Um, the environment and how we respond to the changing climate is a piece of that, um, but then also um, how we respond uh, to these kind of chronic shocks and, and uh, stresses that we face. Um, I, I will add in Nashville, I think there's a lot of folks that look at personal resilience. Um, you've probably heard about kind of the adverse childhood experiences um, focus and our office and our work really brings all that stuff together. Um, really what resilience is, is kind of how are we prepared, our city, our neighborhoods, our families to bounce back from and thrive no matter what challenges um, we face. So we have to know what those challenges are and set ourselves up for how we uh, deal with those challenges, break down artificial silos, and work across those issues, all these issues that matter to our constituents. Um, in, in the resilience view, the constituents don't see traffic, for instance, as an MTA or a public works issue, or flooding as a water services or an OEM issue. Uh, they just know that it's an issue impacting them. And if we're going to see increasing uh, impacts from these changes as we go forward, we need to be um, a more resilient city. So we're going to approach you all about how to engage in that and how your constituents can engage in that. Last week, Paris released their strategy. Atlanta's resilient strategy will come out here in the next few weeks. 
Um, but we're going to do an in-depth dive over the next few months and be facilitating uh, uh, conversations with you all, with your constituents and others, and also putting all of the plans and, and strategies that we have together to kind of weave those things into our resilient strategy. So I just want to take an opportunity to, to kind of go over that with you all tonight. Um, there's a seriousness and an urgency to this work, as Chairman Elrod talked about, and we really can't wait for the next disaster to hit, and we have to address some of these daily disasters. Uh, Harvey, Her Irma, and Maria showed us what nature can do um, to us. We did see the dramatic impacts here in Nashville, as Scott's going to talk about. Um, but I think what you're going to hear tonight, and I hope uh, you'll, you'll um, kind of digest all the good work and, and information that Scott and team have, um, but it's some really amazing work over the last uh, number of years uh, that impacts all of your districts. Uh, this countywide flood protection plan is truly countywide. Um, we're going to continue this work. The stormwater projects that you all helped fund last year, um, home buyouts, and then encouraging with your support and help more low income, I mean, low impact development. All of that is part of this countywide um, plan. But I think part of the point is we've, we've got to attack, protect our economic engine and we've got to protect uh, the hub of our economic engine downtown. Um, the properties downtown have only gotten more valuable since 2010 and we know we can't buy out and move, da move downtown assets. Um, so one of the elements of that and the need that we're going to continue to talk to you about is preventing that flooding in the first place and providing the pump station to evacuate that runoff. Um, we strongly feel that if we're able to mitigate the downtown issues, we start to free up even more dollars and resources to, to continue the work that's happening in your districts. Um, we just simply have to take that next step. So Scott's the expert and uh, thrilled to be with you tonight, but I'm going to turn it over to him to talk to you about the countywide plan. Thank you, Rick. And um, first, I want to thank the council for um, the opportunity I have tonight to introduce this um, countywide flood mitigation system to you. I want to thank Councilman and Ch Chairman Elrod's invitation to speak this evening. And I want to begin by stressing the, the emphasis that we place on public health and welfare in Davidson County. It begins with drinking water, extends to wastewater collection and treatment, and concludes with stormwater management, both water quality and water quantity. Um, as an engineer, I take that very seriously, and I see, uh, I see problems, and I want to go fix them. So we've got a great team that's put together a proposal for y'all, and I want to talk about that tonight. The last time we talked about this, um, I spoke, I think, with a little bit too much emphasis on the downtown part, and I want to talk about the downtown part, but also I want to talk about what we've done throughout the county and what we're going to do continuing throughout the county. But I do want to focus a little bit on protecting um, our city's core. So that'll be a kind of a broader context conversation, and um, let's get started and talk about risk a little bit. So we talked about May 2010. We all remember that, I think, pretty well. $2 billion worth of damages, um, $3.6 billion in lost commerce, and most tragically, we had the, the 11 deaths that um, nothing more than tragic. The rainfall, in some cases, was 19 inches, and I want to trace this, the, uh, the events a little bit before May 3rd and May 4th. If you go back the previous weekend, we had about five and a half inches of rain countywide, and what that did was it made the surfaces of all of Davidson County essentially impervious, because all of the rain that fell on Saturday and Sunday had nowhere to go into the ground. It was all runoff. And that um, caused the Cumberland River to peak at um, 51.8 feet. So today, the Cumberland is probably at about 19 or uh, 18 to 19 feet on a normal day. So the river came up over 35 feet. And um, we all remember that we had widespread loss of life and um, widespread property damage. 
All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about risk and what we do as engineers and what fundamentally I see my job as in Metro Water Services is risk mitigation and risk management. So since 2010, we've had at least six events that would meet or exceed the so-called 100-year threshold. Um, we've talked about 100-year storms, 1,000-year storms. I think if the Weather Service had a do-over on that, they would, they would change the terminology associated with how we characterize storms and speak more in terms of probability. So the probability of a 100-year event in the vernacular is, is more than a 1,000-year event. It doesn't mean at all that if you've had one event, you will not have another. We, speak, we, we strictly talk about probabilities. So I've got six examples here that just to refresh our memory about what happened. April 5th, um, April 27th of 2013, August 8th in 2013. Um, this was a very significant storm in that it hit Madison and North Nashville extremely hard. Um, that was a classic supercell. It um, parked itself on Madison and it did not move. Um, 7.3 inches of rain, and I think that happened in four hours. So we had 200 water rescues, and that storm snuck up on us because in South Davidson County, it was sunny. In North Davidson County, it was raining cats and dogs. October 10th, 2014, another um, event that exceeded the 100-year threshold. July 7th, 2016. Um, that is the, uh, the Richland Creek area, and um, FEMA declared a level three state of emergency. And finally, um, most recently, we had Hurricane Harvey. So the, the key thing there was White's Creek. Um, in North Davidson County, White's Creek went from four feet of elevation to 22 feet in four hours, actually in two hours. So luckily, not luckily, but um, we had developed the SAFE and the NERV program that I'll talk about a little bit. We were able to dispatch emergency crews along White's Creek Corridor to knock on doors and get people evacuated. But one of the things I'm going to stress in the countywide aspect of this approach is home buyouts. In White's Creek, when you drive down, when you drive down Buena Vista, you can't en engineer your way out of that. The only way to solve that problem is to buy the homes, as we've already done, we need to keep buying the homes, return that to green space. And we do two things. Number one, we eliminate the risk of the person that's living in the home. There's going to be a family there that has to be rescued. So number two is we've got firefighters, police officers, first responders that have to go do the rescuing. We want to eliminate both of that. And if we get rid of the home, then we don't have the risk to either party. Let me give you some kind of numbers that you want a little bit about um, parcels in the floodplain. So countywide, um, this is from Jennifer Higgs in the planning department. We've got 16,224 parcels that are in the floodplain, and 4,600 of them are residential parcels that have 800 square feet of the residents in the floodplain. So it's 4,600 um, structures that, are, that have greater than 800 square feet in the floodplain. Okay, um, so let's just pretend that there's a straight river going down the, the aisle here. So on a normal day, the river is in the aisle, and it, it flows and everything's fine. When it rains heavily and it floods, let's, let's visualize a spectacular flood. When you move outside from the normal banks of the river to where you can see the water moving, that's floodway. So when the water stops moving and you see eddies start to form and you see the water really not moving much at all, that's the floodplain. So the floodway is clearly at more risk because the water is moving. And if you think about the, the risk to structures and people and vehicles in moving water, the faster it's moving, the higher the risk. And in the floodway, you can have velocities up to you know, 10 feet per second. So did that capture? Okay. All right, so um, we had emergency crews all over the county, and that talks about risk and risk management. So the, the Unified Flood Preparedness Plan is a risk management tool that
that we've, that we've developed that um, is countywide, that we've executed um, a great deal everywhere except downtown. So I wanna talk about what we've done outside of downtown and what we are proposing to do downtown. All right, so that's the heat map. Um, and this is really a good visual indicator of why we should do home buyouts. If you took those six previous events and we plotted all of the requests for stormwater service, the red indicates the hot area. So, and the green would be, be the cool area. So when Harvey came, when, actually not Harvey yet, when these previous six events, you can see, I'd use my laser pointer, but it disappears on the screen, but you can see the White's Creek Bordeaux area clearly. You can see Madison very clearly, and you can see Richland Creek and um, Browns Creek. You can also see Mill Creek. Um, the heat maps follow the tributary streams pretty closely. And historically, we focused a great deal of home buyout in the, uh, the red areas because that's the way you solve that problem. You can't solve chronic, repeated um, bank flooding with engineering. You have to let nature win and you have to just move out of the way. I think what we've done in the past is we built structures where we shouldn't have built them. Um, and the reason that was the case is that prior to 1979, you could do anything you wanted. You could build, there were no floodplain, floodway restrictions, and we're, we've inherited that problem, but we can't solve it by engineering, by building things. The only way to solve it is to get rid of the structure. Okay, so that's the heat map after um, Harvey. So once again, I'm sorry, yeah, on the left is, on the right is Harvey. On the left is the same week in the previous year. So it's a year to year comparison. So Harvey on the right, once again, you see White's Creek Bordeaux and you see Richland Creek, Browns Creek, Mill Creek. So not much of a concentration in Madison, but a little bit um, not as dramatic as it was in the previous slide. But once again, you see the concentrations. All right, so now let's talk about what to expect. Um, a great deal of discussion in the political realm of like climate change, global warming, things of that nature. In Metro Water Services, we don't really wanna engage in the politics of it. We just wanna prepare for the probability. And if you look at the blue line, those are um, declared emergencies by FEMA that are due to flooding or flooding type events. So you're seeing more events. And a lot of the people in this room grew up around here. I grew up in Hendersonville, and I will state that it did not used to rain like this. I think things are different. Um, why, I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. All I know is I think it's different, and I think the data supports that. So with that data, I think it makes sense to listen to the probabilities and prepare accordingly. The map on the left indicates um, increased rain activity. So the green indicates above historical averages and Tennessee is um, right in that band. All right, so what's next? So let's talk about what we've done in the past um, and then we'll talk about what we're proposing. Since 2002, I think it's very important to talk about We've, invest, we've invested $140 million countywide, and I'm gonna kinda itemize that a little bit. The 3.7 million was essentially step one after the flood, because we didn't have the ability to predict where the flood waters were going to attack the city, essentially. Um, we had a lot of knowledge in people's heads, we had a lot of experience, but we didn't have anything that was hard engineering to really give us a tool to predict where the water is gonna be. So what we did is we built a, a, a real-time model of the Cumberland River and the five major tributaries that is, uses two-foot interval, um, it's called LIDAR data, but it's, it's got two-foot intervals. And it, it'll allow us, using the, the sentient conditions of the ground, the predictions of the weather, um, rain event, the rain totals, and what the river um, le level is at the beginning to predict with the forecast how high the river will get. And 
that system works. It's proven itself repeatedly. Um, most recently, as I discussed, in, um, in August with the Harvey incident, we were able to get police and fire out to Buena Vista in the Bordeaux area and get people evacuated. So that was the SAFE program. The NERV program um, was developed by Metro Planning, specifically Jennifer Higgs, and she deserves a spectacular amount of credit for this. That's, a, that's the public-facing element of SAFE. Um, the, the perfect example of what SAFE can do for our citizens is if their home is identified to be at risk and they need to evacuate, and we have a shelter identified somewhere else, they can type in their address, click on where the closest shelter is, and the, and the NERV program will route them around closed roads to get them to the, the safe area. That's the level of sophistication of the NERV program. So we did that first. Then you look at the, uh, the second bullet with the house. $43.8 million has been spent total on home acquisition. And to me, that is a 100% accurate stormwater project because you do not have the risk anymore. Um, certainly, it, it's, it's, not, it's not fortunate for the person that has to move because they are leaving their neighborhood. But what we do is we, we offer them fair market value for the home and not the, the flooded value. We do fair market value. We offer them that amount. And if they so choose to take it, we buy the home and it's declared green space. And in, in, I can't say that word, but forever, we can't build on it, okay? It's green space. We can make um, gardens out of it, we can make a ball field out of it, but we can't put a structure on it. So that solves that problem forever. And then, the $93 million, that's been stormwater work that this council has authorized. And we mentioned um, how good it is that y'all, um, voted to increase the stormwater fee such that we can enhance the amount of projects that we're doing. And let me give you some ideas of what's happening right now. So last year, we did $10 million a year in capital work on stormwater, and that's construction of new stormwater facilities. But we've also greatly enhanced our ability to do sea projects. And I want to introduce Casey Cooper over here. Y'all probably know Casey. He, he does the, the so-called small projects that really impact y'all's districts and y'all's neighborhoods dramatically. So in this year alone, it's just, um, it's October the 10th, Casey's been able to complete 52 projects. He's got 17 that are, that are happening right now, 18 are in the, re in the requisition phase, and 25 are out to bid. So we're doing a lot more work throughout the county using the stormwater funds that y'all authorized. So. Um, I think that was really good on y'all's part, and I think that we're delivering on, um, on what we said we would do. But the key thing is, at $93 million, that's been the county. That hasn't been downtown. What we've done downtown on um, stormwater has been taking the storm grates that are parallel to the road and making them crossways so our, our friends on bicycles don't crash into the storm grates. So we're going to keep doing that, but... I want to invest, and I'm proposing that we invest downtown as well. We talked about safe and nerve. We talked about home buyouts. Um, on the bottom, we have the, we've um, right now we've got 600 properties that we've we have on the priority list, about 143 million dollars. So 150 million dollars falls out of the sky, which it won't. But we could go buy, you know, 600 homes. But like I said earlier, we've got 4,600 that are in the floodplain. The good thing is, with each home, we're making incremental improvement. Okay, here's an example, Battlemont Park, um, just inside 440. That's the uh, photograph in 2009, and that's the photograph today. So there are some holdouts um, in that neighborhood. Some of those homeowners decided not to take the buyout. Bad news is in, um, in Harvey, this, uh, this area got hammered pretty hard again. So um, the good news is if someone declines a, a home buyout offer, we don't take them off the list. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to revisit them and reoffer um, as funds become available. But that's a really good green space um, for our county, and it's also 
area where water can infiltrate into the ground and it doesn't run off until it gets saturated. These are examples of the, of the, the capital and maintenance projects that we do around the county. We've got CDs full of photographs that we can share, you, share with you. Um, I think we've had a great success in attacking stormwater issues at the neighborhood level using the A-level projects, the, the $20 million pot of money. Um, what we do is we try to um, collate neighborhood issues and solve them with um, a significant stormwater project so we can solve as many problems as we can with one project. Let's talk about LID, um, low impact development. In the stormwater management manual, now we require developers to retain the first inch of rain that hits a lot. And that's a very significant thing because that first inch of rain doesn't go onto the neighbors, it stays on site. Then 1.1 inches of rain, then you have runoff. But most of our events are about one inch or less. So the LID does a lot of things for us. Number one, it keeps the water out of the collection system. Number two, you know, the earth is a spectacular water purification device. It allows it to uh, absorb into the earth and the water is cleaned and reintroduced into the aquifer. Also, it really enhances the livability of our city. Um, if you look at that, that's at Hill Center. This is Hill Center, the Publix. You know, in a parking lot 25 years ago, that had been one big sheet of asphalt, you know. Now, that collects rainwater. It looks very nice. It mitigates the heat island effect. A whole lot of things it does. But this demonstrates that we have a comprehensive approach to stormwater management. LID plays a very large role in that. Okay? Finally, we partner greatly with um, nonprofits. The, um, a really good example is our partnership with the National Tree Foundation. A tree is a spectacular stormwater device. It absorbs a whole lot of water. And we spend a whole lot of time and a whole lot of um, resources planting trees. Right now, Metro Water Services is in the market to hire someone whose entire job is going to be to plant trees and to have other people plant trees. So partnering with the Tree Foundation, we are going to increase the canopy. Um, Hands on Nashville, their work um, needs no further accolade because they do spectacular work. And the Cumberland River Compact. They are a partner with us um, specifically on the Cumberland main stem. But anything that impacts the Cumberland, the, uh, the, the compact has an interest in it as well. There's been a lot of discussion in the media lately about um, global events due to flooding. Um, Houston jumps immediately to mind because of the extraordinary nature of that storm. 50 inches of rain, um, just incredible. But Nashville's been specifically mentioned for our approach to stormwater management. So I think um, we're, we're being recognized as being uh, forward thinking, and I think we should continue, continue down that path. All right, so now, that's a summary. I want to continue to provide the flood warning to our citizens, continue countywide to buy out homes as fast as we can, continue to do the stormwater work that we've got programmed, that number, um, we're in year one of our five-year program, 215 capital projects, $100 million. All of that is in the county. So let's talk about the downtown portion now. So let's, let's compare 2010 to 2017 to kind of set the table for why I really think we should consider moving forward with the downtown portion of our, of our program. So that's 2010. Here we are in 2017. So if you look at the number of employees, <coughs> excuse me, we've gone up 23% in seven years. The residents, over 100%. And then the property value, that's just extraordinary. Um, by the way, this isn't a Metro Water Services number, this is a Metro Planning number. So it's um, almost 300% value increase um, in the downtown land value. So I think that's something we should, um, we should protect. So how's it gonna work? Okay, so I've got a couple of photographs I'm gonna show you, or pictures I'm gonna show you a little bit later, but there's four components. There's, there's the flood panels that um, when people talk about the flood wall, that's the, the removable flood panels. The gate closures, 
will isolate the river from the stormwater drainage system. The pumping station gets the water from one side of the wall to the other. And then an emergency power component, which is obviously important. Presumably, if we have a, a May 2010 or worse type of event, we have a high probability of losing power. What we don't want to have is a nice little pump station sitting there with no electricity. So we're going to build emergency power, um, hopefully right next to DES. But the good news is, is that when we're not using it, DES can use it for load sharing and load shaving. So it's not something that will just sit there and gather dust. All right, so that's a, there's a very basic photograph of how it's going to work. So you've got the river on, on the right side of the wall, and you've got downtown on the left side of the wall. So if you put the flood wall in place, the pump is required to get the water from the left side of the wall back to the river. The key thing about that is that water was going to the river in the first place. That's where it's going. We're stopping it with the wall. And we're doing that because we're trying to keep the river from going upstream or uphill. So the pump station takes the water that falls on downtown, drains down, downhill to the wall, and puts it back in the river. The, um, the stormwater lines, I'll show that in the next slide. We install gates that will close those drains to prevent the river from backing up into those storm drains. And then we have one more thing called the First Avenue Tunnel that we'll have to isolate as well. And that's better seen here. So the flood wall, um, the removable flood panels, they go from about Malloy Street to, uh, Nashboro, to Fort Nashboro. Okay? The pump station is just immediately upstream of the, uh, the uh, pedestrian bridge. And then we've got the gate closures just to the upstream side of the pedestrian bridge as well, actually of uh, the Korean Veterans Bridge. And then we have two gate valves, one well downstream and one well upstream that isolates the First Avenue Tunnel. Just to remind you all, in May 2010, I've told you all this several times, but it's really remarkable. Since May 2010, we've taken out 1,000 tons of debris out of that tunnel, 1,000 tons. So we can't let that happen again. I mean, this is, that's extraordinary damage to our wastewater collection system. So that's how it'll work. This is not difficult engineering. It's not inexpensive engineering, but it's not difficult. One of the things we're not doing is pushing the envelope in design. This system has been vetted, um, it's been computer modeled, and it's also been modeled with an actual model. We built a model of downtown and the system, and we um, put the same circumstances as May 2010 on the model, ran it, and it worked. Good news is we've designed this, um, the flood panels, to be two feet above May 2010. So we're adding even more of a margin of error on the system. All right, so now, <clears throat> Mr. Withers, I'm sure you're curious about East Nashville, and I'm going to make another attempt at explaining how this is going to work and it's not going to impact East Nashville. So that's the watershed. The dark blue, if you're a raindrop and you land in the dark blue, you're going to end up just south, or I guess just a little bit further downstream on Broadway. Okay? You're going to be in the Cumberland River, and you're going to try your best to get out of the river at the, um, at the end of the Cumberland River and go to Clarksville. So that's an enormous watershed. Okay, the little picture on the circle, that represents downtown that was flooded, that would be eliminated using the, the downtown flood protection system. So what happens is the water in the light blue in that circle, that water that would, that would go to the river anyway, still goes to the river, but what the river sees is an absence of you know, the point zero 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 eight percent of storage. So we're not putting, we're putting one sixteenth of an inch of additional level of water in the river. We're not increasing the flow velocity. It's completely, um, in, it doesn't affect East Nashville, is the summary. 
We've got three engineering studies that um, talk about that. And I, I think we've, I think I've exhausted my ability to explain that. So I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more, but um, the summary is I'm just, I'm sure. And we've got three independent engineering surveys that, that confirm it. And if I have, if I come up with a better way of explaining it, I'll do it. But um, that's just a hard one to explain. That's the one sixteenth of an inch. Okay, so going forward, what are we going to do in, in discussion? So in November, we're going to invite y'all out to Metro Water Services, and we'll go into the engineering. I'll go into enormous detail about how it actually works. We'll go through the design, and we'll actually go through a presentation that shows the execution. So we, we redo May 2010 with the system built, and we show exactly what happens downtown, um, how the system works, when, when we open and close gates, when we put up the flood panels up, um, that'll be in November. At the conclusion of this presentation, um, you're each going to get a, a packet that shows the stormwater work we've done in your district, and then we're going to be in direct contact with y'all, hoping that I can come out to your districts and give this presentation, talk to your constituents about the proposal, talk about their concerns, um, generally speaking about stormwater, get their ideas, and see if we can move forward not only with what we've done in the county, but what we've also proposed to do downtown. So this is the summary. We've done 43.8 million in home buyout, 93 million in stormwater projects, a lot of LID work. The nonprofit community is well engaged. And um, safe and nerve, we've talked about that in great detail. And that concludes my presentation. So um, I hope you all have lots of questions. We'll stay here as long as uh, y'all like. But um, I, I really strongly believe in this entire approach, not just downtown, but countywide. I think it'll work, and I think we've uh, made significant strides, and I suggest we continue. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Potter. One question, I guess, to start off with. So, um, I guess what you're, let me, I guess, make sure I get what you're saying. In 2015, the, the downtown flood wall and other, and the, I guess, the flood preparedness plan was proposed. And so, since then, y'all have basically put into effect that flood plan except for the downtown portion. Is that correct? That's correct. And to kind of give a timeline of, of our approach to this, about in two years ago, when we initially began the discussion of the, the flood protection system, I had essentially two options. I could, I could bring the stormwater fee to the council, or I could bring the flood protection system to the council, or I could bring both. So what, what I decided to do was to bring the stormwater fee proposal to the council to get the established revenue stream to continue the stormwater work in the county. And then this year, I want to bring the, the downtown flood protection system as a component of the countywide approach to, to further um, our mitigation efforts in, in, the, in the entire county. So we've been working on this since 2010. We began um, discussing our options in July of 2010. And um, now we're at the point where this is essentially step one to the proposal. Um, I'm bringing it to y'all. I want to get your, your thoughts on whether or not we should proceed with a discussion. And then go to your constituents, talk to them about what their thoughts are. And then my intention is to, is to um, propose it in the capital improvement budget for um, fiscal year 18. I guess fiscal year 19. All right, we'll start at the top of the list. Councilman Schulman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Potter, Mr. Cole. Um, so um, I think I've just got two questions. Um, one is on the $93 million that's been spent, that's already been spent in terms of projects, right? That's correct. We've can, got um, all the data you would ever want about everything we've spent that money on, so we can give all that to you if you'd okay, like. Okay, so that was going to be my question. Have you got it itemized? Absolutely. Have you got it by district? All that stuff. Any way you want it. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, I think people would probably be interested in that. Okay. Um, 
Uh, and my second question would be, uh, you say you have models and other things like that. Have, have other cities built walls like this? Well, in, the, in recent history, not really, because um, the perfect example is Louisville. Um, they had the 1937 flood, and they built a system similar to this, um, a lot more extensive because they have a whole lot more riverfront on the floodway and the floodplain, but they have a gate system and they have a removable wall with a pump station. Um, a year ago, I saw a very detailed presentation by um, the water company, essentially, of the Netherlands, and they've approached their flooding a lot like we have in that they're trying to recover storage and not just fight um, the Atlantic Ocean, essentially. So a lot of work's been done in Europe, but the cities that have the risk that Louisville would have, they've done their flood mitigation work earlier. Um, we haven't invested in this system until the proposal that I have before you now. So a lot of really good data in Europe, like the, the removable flood system, um, the, the flood panels, I got that idea directly from the Netherlands. Okay, so, um, but if we were looking for, well, let's stick with this country first. If we were looking for cities that have, obviously there's lots of cities that have waterfronts just like we do. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm thinking of Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, places like that. Um, do those cities have systems like this in case it floods? They do. Similar? It's, um, like I said, in Louisville, it's a lot more extensive because okay. they, have, they have more area to protect. I mean, have you got, so if we were interested, I mean, in terms of trying to find out how they dealt with their systems and their situations, are there, I mean, are the things that you can show us sure. that other cities did yeah. that did the same type of thing? I could. Okay. Um, I think I'd be interested in that. All right. I mean, it, it certainly would go a long way in terms of explaining what we're doing. And, and then you can throw in Europe as well, the Netherlands. Um, um, besides the Netherlands, anybody else? I mean, there's obviously other cities that have the same Historically, type of Historically, New Orleans is a, you know, jumps to mind. They have yeah. a spectacular levee system, pumping system. Um, Cincinnati. I'm most familiar with Louisville, but I can, I can get more examples of, of United States cities that have a, a mitigation system like this one. Okay. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. I think I even remember, like in St. Louis, when I've been, it's been a while, but I think going down to the riverfront, they have, I think some of their roads that go down to the river, they have, I think, spots for walls or something that go in. But well, I'm just trying to figure out whether we need to send our chairman to the Netherlands to figure out what's <laughs> going on. But, you know, thank you. It's, it's clear in our early work with the other uh, network cities that uh, this, this issue, this risk and shock for Nashville was one of the reasons that um, you know, we uh, wanted our C network picked us. And so, um, you know, Scott mentioned New Orleans, but also Norfolk, uh, New York, uh, Miami. I mean, lots of cities that are dealing with um, water issues. So we can, we can pile on that too in terms of what their resilience strategies look like. Um, very clear though that how we have our, you know, how we manage our relationship with our river and with increasing rain and flood is a, you know, top five shock and stress for the city. I'd like to add one thing if I could. Sure. Um, one of the things about our downtown design proposal, there isn't a whole lot of flexibility because we do have to isolate the two major stormwater lines that come down the hill. We do have to isolate First Avenue Tunnel. We do have to, you know, have a, a flood wall that we can build up and we do have to have a, a pump station. So all those components are necessary and they have to be built concurrently. So a different design really isn't, isn't really on the table um, because all those things have to be built. We couldn't not do one thing and do the other. So we don't have a whole lot of flexibility on how we approach the design. Well, and I, I guess um, just to continue, I mean, obviously other cities are, have the same, any city that's built well, close to a river is going to have the same type of problem. So the question is, is Nashville any different from any other city? Are other cities experiencing the same amount of, uh, or increased rainfall like you talked about? And so what are they doing about it? Are they, do they have other options because of the way they're built? Um, are we kind of restricted because of the way our city is built and so forth? Um, 
So uh, let me ask, if it's okay, let me ask one last question, and, and that's regarding Bordeaux and just the recent activities out there. Um, again, though, seeing the water came up very, very quickly, is anything being done to help that situation or address that situation right now? Home buyouts. Um, we're exploring getting more funding for home buyouts. Um, I, I, I personally drove Buena Vista this week, and I started at the very top of the county at the headwaters of White's Creek, and I drove all the way until I couldn't get on a road near White's Creek. And just looking at the river, uh, at the creek, and looking at the topography, and looking at the homes, there isn't a stormwater device that we can build that will solve it. Um, you can't build a dam, as an example. Um, you can't build a giant tunnel. So the only way to solve that problem permanently is to buy the homes out. That way we eliminate the risk. If we spend money trying to engineer our way out of it, we're not going to solve it and we're gonna spend a whole lot of money. So I'd rather take the money that we would use if we we're gonna to try to control the water to buy the homes and, and remove those families from risk. Again, nothing structural engineering you can do. There's really them. not. Um, it's just uh, a, a stream is going to behave like a stream. And one of the things that Americans have done nationally is try to control water and try to, um, the perfect example is Los Angeles and the Los Angeles River. You can't control a river. The river will win. So throwing money at the problem, I just don't think is the way to do it. I think we live with the river and we remove the human risk from the river. That way the river can be itself, we recover the green space, and we don't find ourselves in a position of trying to spend more and more money chasing our tails. All right, thank you. Councilman Bednay. So what you just said, it's uh, kind of a contradiction because you are asking us to do one thing for downtown and the opposite for the rest of the city. Well, we can't relocate I, I get you, I get you. So I want to ask you about the rest of the city because I already saw what you guys proposed for downtown and I approve it. It's a great project. I met with the engineers a couple of years ago. Good stuff. So you guys had a report done with um, and submitted to the federal government that includes uh, removing some of the houses on the floodplain, but also doing uh, overflow. Mm -hmm. But you won't ask for funding to do the overflow. Well, we're gonna, are you speaking of the Mill Creek project? Yes, sir. Okay. The, the contract is, is back at the core. Um, Metro Legal has, has approved it. So once the core approves it, we can come to y'all to get the funding for those 43 homes on Mill Creek and the enhancements on the Brawley Parkway Bridge to, in, to add the barrel underneath um, Brawley Parkway. So that will improve the throughput on Mill Creek at Brawley Parkway. The second phase to that is um, on the Seven Mile Creek aspect, we're gonna go through that process as well. But as you well know, the process to get funding from the core is extremely long and it's gonna take a long time, but we're gonna continue that process. The good news is we've got the Mill Creek funding ready to go. And just by the way, it's not 43 million that we're paying, it's a 65-35 share. Um, and um, so we'll be in a position to move forward with that. And then on the Seven Mile Creek, we're gonna continue that as well. But we are not waiting for, for the federal government to pay for the downtown flood. That's correct. So I'm, I'm asking for the same uh, that we are getting ready to do for the downtown flood for the rest of the city. So. Let me ask you something else, and, and I know you told me no before, but I, I'm a pain, and so I'm not going to ask you again. We have homeowners that uh, are not taking care of their properties when they have a creek in the back or they have a, um, an issue with uh, flooding because they don't have the financial capacity to do it. And that has an impact in how the water flows through uh, my district. We have many uh, homeowners whose houses were approved before you guys started reviewing uh, site plans. And so there are deficiencies in how the water flows in many parts of my district. I even have uh, slides and that sort of thing. Now, I asked you before, and you told me you couldn't do it because of the charter and so forth. Uh, 
that we couldn't uh, get into a private property and do improvements to that property. But I challenge you to work with the private sector and see if we could create some kind of a, a grant system to help homeowners who are on a fixed income uh, to be able to, to do that. As a matter of fact, I, I think I told to uh, Eric Cole the same about come up, coming up with a program like that because usually our home repairs just deal with the home and not with the site. So I would like to ask again that uh, any system is as weak as its weakest link. And this is the weakest link. We have lots of homes. I have creeks in, uh, that are going through backyards in my district that the homeowners are not able to keep them up. And the water starts backflowing because it cannot flow. And you guys are not allowed to go and clean it up. And so we depend on the private sector, on nonprofits, and that sort of thing. So I think to have a comprehensive solution, we have to look at that as well without endangering people being able to stay in their homes. So thank you. Yes, sir. Council Lady Vercher. Thank you, Chair. There was a, a request earlier. Um, I just want to reiterate that about us receiving um, the itemization by district. Chair, if you can make sure that the entire body receives that report from Director Parter. Director Parter, thank you uh, for the presentation. I have two questions. I'm following up with uh, my Southeast colleague here. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm hearing it correctly. Actually, I may have three or four questions, but never mind. So um, you said structurally um, there's nothing you would be able to do as it relates to the Bordeaux area. Well, Is that applicable to the southeast area too? It's unique for each situation. Okay. And, and, that's, what, and that's why when we have a stormwater discussion in, in, this, in this body, each, each district is going to have a unique situation. So in, in Bordeaux, in White's Creek, it, a lot of it is, is still rural, in especially in the upper reaches of White's Creek. But as you get closer to the city, it becomes more densely populated. And a lot of the homes were built right next to the creek. So structurally, I don't think we should invest in building something to try to mitigate that. I think we should buy those homes. When you go somewhere else in a more urbanized area, then you don't have necessarily the option to buy out a home. So you have to look to structural solutions. The problem you have there is that you have to pick a, a storm design criteria that you design to. As an example, a 100 year event, a 1000 year event. So the more extreme storm you design for, the more extensive the infrastructure. So in your district, we'd have to approach it probably a whole lot differently than we would approach it in Bordeaux. But it would be a unique approach. And that those projects come out of the $100 million that y'all approved in the stormwater fee enhancement. So we've got projects planned for the next five years, 20 million a year, that will address specifically that type of issue. Okay, thank you. I'm just um, uh, thinking about just the overall, the, the community engagement piece. Um, because with everything that's going on that this council is facing and, and the community discussions that we have, there's a perception that everything goes, is geared towards downtown. So for, for Southeast or for the Bordeaux area, we know that the, the plan is, um, I have my notes here, what you referenced it as, the downtown flood protection system. So for our other areas, what, what, are, we, what are we calling that? Is that flood mitigation? Is that a, a stormwater initiative? Okay. How do we get the other communities on board that this is a valuable right. um, investment, not just for downtown, but for as the city as a whole? I totally understand. In May 2010, actually in July 2010, we, we began the process of identifying a countywide approach to flood mitigation. And we went through a, a really extensive community engagement process that resulted in the unified flood preparedness plan. The things that came out of that were safe and nerve enhanced home buyouts, and then more stormwater investment. So the downtown portion came out of the UFPP as a, essentially a damage center that was localized downtown. So it's all one plan, and I really, I've been trying hard tonight to stress that we see this as one component 
to the entire approach. So in your district, as an example, I would stress what we're doing with the $100 million that we're investing countywide. I would stress what we, what we propose on home buyouts, if any, in your district. And I would reinforce the fact that we have the warning system um, for your citizens. But in each district, we'll have a unique solution to the unique problem. And that's why we're going to contact you um, starting tomorrow to try to come talk to your constituents and see what we can do to um, further our efforts. Because I think we've had um, good success in um, doing a whole lot of projects around the county. I think Mr. Cole wanted to ask you. And Council Lady, I mean, you'll, you'll get here this after, this evening a uh, pretty good folder that Scott's team has put together that talks about the work that's happened actually in your district specifically. So we got all the community engagement you, you will take from us uh, in that, you know, I think Scott and his team are willing to come out and, and communicate what's actually happening and, and what, this el what the elements are that are going on in your district specifically. Um, we also have to do a deep dive analysis of our resilience across the city, and I know that doesn't sound very exciting, um, but we need to specifically hear from the communities across the county about what they see as their, um, the, these biggest shocks and issues in your community. So w w there's a twofer there and that we will come out as well uh, if you will invite us um, to, to do that element too, which is very much a community um, listening session to try to understand, um, you know, are we addressing all of the elements around um, how the, the government serves your constituents um, in the context of resilience. So that's not just stormwater, that's transportation, that's transit, that's um, other elements as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think so part of what you're hearing tonight is that willingness to come out and engage, um, if y'all will introduce us and, and bring us to the uh, community. Yes, great point, great point. So what other community engagement efforts will be um, implemented beyond um, utilizing us as council members? Will they receive notices in the mail? Uh, oh, sure. Okay. Um, just like when we do a project in your district, we'll, we'll send out letters to each constituent. We'll put it on our website. We'll tweet it. We'll do everything we can to get the word out about the meeting. Is that certified mail? I've had constituents indicate that they don't receive those notices. Um, that'd be pretty expensive for us to do certified mail on construction projects. We send it to the address we have on their um, water and sewer bill. Okay, and then two more questions. Thank you for indulging me, Chair. Um, so, LID, is that required for all development or just specifically for flood-prone areas? For new construction, um, the one-inch capture is required. Okay. And then my last question, with the home buyout, um, do, do, do we pay, I don't, I don't know how that, how that metrics work as how we determine what we should be paying for the actual property? Is it a sufficient amount? Okay, what we the, do the is- The value of the home, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. We retain an independent appraiser. Okay. And we go through, just like the government is gonna buy a house because that's what we're doing. We get an appraiser, um, fair market value. We, we do not include the fact that the home floods. So they get essentially a much better deal from the government than they would on the open market because we're getting market value absent the risk to flood. So I think the, I think the home buyout program is fair. Um, I think it's equitable and I think it works. So as much uh, funding as y'all can give us, I would enthusiastically accept. So what we say that uh, th those individuals, those families that elect to opt into the home buyout, they are able to relocate successfully. We're not displacing families or are they able to, to relocate within the county or you're not tracking that data? I don't, well, I mean, so, I mean, part of this history for me was that, you know, when I was in Anthony's seat, we had, you know, I had uh, about 90 homes up by Shelby Bottoms that were flooded out. Um, the folks, I had people that were lined up to be bought out and the folks that were bought out and moved on did great and were able to go elsewhere in Nashville and, and the acquire The city wasn't home. that expensive then, so though. So that was a different time, you're yes. right, 2010. Um, but we weren't able to buy out all the individuals that wanted it. Uh, in the because of the financial resources, so um, it was uh, 
uh, it was an in-demand um, need uh, at the time. I'll also say at that point in time, C projects and B projects, you, we had no hope of them getting done. Um, because before the stormwater fee and then before y'all increased it last year, um, we would sit there and look at projects, they would engineer them, they would look at them, this is in the general stormwater context, and we'd have to tell our constituents we just don't have any way to, to do those. So that's a major step in the right direction that this council and the last council took. Thank you, Chair. Council Lady, council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Potter, I appreciate the um, presentation, and I have a coworker who has thanked me repeatedly uh, for getting a property bought out. So I can I can attest that it is it is popular this go round as as well. You may have said it, but I, I missed it, or maybe you're not quite ready to say it. Do we have a new budget for this project yet, or is that forthcoming? Well, the number that was published in the last pr proposal was 125 million. I'm reticent to say it's 125 million at this point because of the environment in which we're operating now. What I intend to do is gauge the interest in the council of pursuing discussions and then getting an accurate estimate of uh, construction expense and then bringing that back to the council in the, in the CIB process. Great, and this, this again will be industrial revenue bonds when it is issued, is that correct? I, I think it'd be water and sewer bonds. Water and sewer bonds, yeah. which function Similarly, with regard to how they're paid back out of yeah. water and sewer revenues. To us, this is a, a another project. Um, Just a big it, one. It's, a, it's a, a significant project. It's not the largest project we've managed. Um, it's, in my experience, the third largest one that we that we would prospectively manage. Right. Thank you, Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director Potter and Mr. Go. Being on the council during the last go around of the flood wall, um, there were several statements made that this is more of a suggestion rather than a, mm -hmm. than a question, but uh, of those statements made, I, I, I think you've addressed several of them in this go around, and, and especially uh, considering the, the Madison area and my district in particular, uh, my district, most of it lies between, it is a bend. So it's basically two rivers plus the Gibson Creek. Right. So we've, uh, we've seen our share of flooding. And um, I think most, uh, a lot of the constituents have been, have seen the result of your buyout program and the, um, um, some of the uh, C projects, but also now with the uh, major, with the increase, we've, uh, there are several, but you know, being in that area, that is, and developers developing the way they did in the 70s, there seemed to be, uh, I've had uh, members of your, of uh, Stormwater come out, and we've sat down and talked with people who are victims of, of flooding, and it basically comes down to, there were, you live between two rivers and the water is running is going to try to get to that river as quickly as it can or as as uh, feasibly as it can is there any type i know we're, we can't at the end of the day the my constituents want to say well what can you do and we say well the A projects, the B projects can help, and you all have done very good at, at uh, uh, implementing some of those projects lately. But is there some sort of private plan or private entity that can provide them with assistance, even they say, well, we can't do anything because of the way our charter is made up. Can we direct them somewhere? I think that goes to Councilman Bedney's point and I, and I think that's a great point. Um, when you go back to your discussion about what we've done in, in Madison, Mr. Cole mentioned earlier that seven or eight years ago, most of the discussion was about what we couldn't do. And that was really frustrating for us and for y'all. That has transitioned a great deal to what we can do because we do have 20 million a year and three million a year, <coughs> excuse me, on the C projects. 
So that discussion has changed a great deal. But then you have to transition to the discussion about what do you want to, what can you do with additional money? And our sources of additional money is the federal government and FEMA and TEMA um, after a disaster. From our perspective, with the extreme weather events we've had in the last 12 months na na nationally, the FEMA and TEMA money is not going to be available because if you look at Houston, a lot of money from the federal government is going to go to Houston, Miami, South Florida, Puerto Rico. A lot of money that may have been available to us simply will not. So we have to look at what we can do with local funding. Um, so I think your point about extending the discussion to the private sector and the uh, nonprofit sector is, is a good approach because um, that is something we really haven't aggressively explored. So I think that we, we should do that. And again, I want to thank you for the, the increase in projects and, and, and being in a flood prone area. Uh, I've, I've gotten several comments from constituents who have said that they appreciate the uh, the uh, increase in activity. But, it's a direct result of but, what y'all did. I mean, but you, but you also at the end of the day, they live. We live between two rivers, yeah. so um, there, there there's the frustration level is still there. I totally so, get it. And that's why we're trying to, I hate to leave their house saying there's nothing we can do. As do we. I mean, right. And, and, and as the engineer is standing, uh, Mr. Swift is with me on several occasions where we had to say that. But I would like to be able to refer them to say, well, you know, maybe there, we can't do anything, but here are some possible avenues that you can look at through other, other ways. That's a great idea. Thank you. So I wasn't going to, now that it's come up twice, I've got a to-do note. I mean, part of our network, part of the resources that we have access to, we'll, we'll go in tomorrow and see if uh, there might be some partners we can leverage through the Resilient Cities efforts. Because part of the end of the day for us is coming up with a strategy going forward that does have uh, funding and implementation options um, attached to it. And so we have a lot of resources, hopefully, that we could draw upon and take this idea and see if there are some models that have done uh, public-private partnership, et cetera. And just for an observation, by so much going on now in the, in the outer, outside the downtown district, I think it'll be a, be a little easier for us to explain when the time comes. Or well said. One thing um, that I'd like to place into consideration for y'all, if we had May 2010 occur again and the system was in place and we didn't have the damage to downtown, all the resources that we had to dedicate to putting downtown back together can be applied outside of downtown. So there's a whole lot of other benefits um, that are direct that we could that we can use, I think, as an, as an example as to why it's a good idea to protect downtown as well as um, what we've done in the county. Councilman Cooper. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I greatly admire the professionalism of the Water Department. Two questions. Uh, would the flood wall reduce insurance payments for downtown Nashville with $1 billion, $10 billion of the property, sort of what's the underwriting event? I don't know. Okay. But you would think it would presumably be substantial since hundreds of millions of dollars were lost downtown in the last flood, and presumably the private carriers are marking up their insurance rates to cover that. Yes, sir. That's um, it's a valid point. I'm just not qualified to answer that question. Okay. Would you all undertake a, a query on sure. that? Sure, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll ask um, uh, the economic folks to look at that. Secondly, um, this is paid for by water revenue bonds, which is really funded by water bills mm -hmm. for the whole county. Um, what would one expect the water bill to increase by to cover an additional $125 million? All right. Um, I don't have an exact answer to that. One of the things that we need to kind of remind ourselves of is that this is an expensive project. But to us, it's another project. And it would go into the capital budget. 
and it would be a significant part of the capital budget. But you are carrying a billion dollars in debt currently, so this is really just increasing that by about 10 percent, and then that's just the portion of your operating revenue going to debt service, so presumably it could be a surprisingly small percentage increase. It could be, but I, I really don't want to okay. go there without... without well, equally, could I ask you to sure. look into that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Mendez. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Has, uh, just a hopefully quick questions, um, has uh, this plan for downtown been integrated with the idea of a 50 foot below grade transit tunnel under downtown popping up in South Broadway, South of Broadway area? No, but as a good engineer, I can solve that problem. <laughs> okay. Um, is the pumping, how many pumps will be in the pumping station? I think it's five, six. And uh, I've heard different things anecdotally from different people in this building. Um, does the Corps of Engineers have to approve this project? Approve is the wrong word because we're not going to be, um, the, the pump station envelope will not be in the navigable mm -hmm. waterway. So we will be in partnership with the Corps and they are in support. So approve may be um, the wrong word. So, because if we got into the navigable waterway, it would be approved that we intentionally got out of that footprint to eliminate that risk. So, uh, so I characterize it right. What is the right word? I don't know, but approval, um, I don't think is really accurate because they can't, they couldn't stop us as an example, because we wouldn't be in a position where we'd be regulated. And like I said, I mean, they've been a full partner with us in, in this discussion, and they, they are in support. So one of the things that I've heard anecdotally is that at one point the Corps was asked about this, and they said no. Is that? I'd like to know. It's all before my time, so. Well, I'd like to know who said it and when, because I can't really answer that kind of a question without the specifics. But the Corps has been on board. They've been with us since July of 2010. They're in support of the project. They've said that recently. So I don't see that as a risk. All right. And I want to, uh, I mean, I know you remember that uh, two budgets ago, it was my uh, amendment, maybe Councilman Cooper's amendment to have uh, money in the budget to engage in countywide uh, engagement. And, um, and, and what I'm sort of hearing is the, you guys will be happy to go talk to any group that a council member, a district council member invites you to. Um, I mean, wh wh what was the intent a couple of years ago with the money um, for uh, countywide community engagement? And how's, it, it, it feels like instead of whatever that plan was, that it's a different plan now. Well, um, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I can't tell you how we're going to approach every single community group. All I'm going to tell you is that we're going to aggressively do that. And um, when I when I pitched the stormwater fee last year, we did we did that. So what I can assure you is that we're going to be in the public and we're going to be um, talking about this as much as we can. And all I can give you is my assurance on that. And you can take that if you want to or not, but we'll be out there and we'll be selling it. I mean, it, you sound a little defensive, sort of like that audit committee meeting. I'm not saying you're not going to do it. I'm asking a question of absent council members inviting you to meetings. What's the game plan for community engagement? That's a fair question other than just trust me, I'll do it. Well, um, I really don't know what to say other than that, Councilman, because we're going to be in the public as much as we can. Uh, a good example is the downtown partnership. Um, we have relationships with all of the nonprofits. We can reach out to them. I'm, I'm very comfortable and confident that we'll have a, a big footprint of discussion out in the county. All right. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Chair, thank you. Just, Councilman, real fast. I mean, we've, we're going to do a community engagement effort around resilience. One of the issues we all face, though, in Nashville right now is that we have a little bit of planning fatigue, and so 
you know, we have this challenge. If I say we're going to have a community meeting on resilience, that's not necessarily the kind of thing people are going to turn out for. So at least on our side of the house, the strategy is to go where there are existing groups and organizations and talk about um, the holistic ap approach. Um, I can assure you we have plans to do that, and but we also, um, you know, we, we are not planning to go out and do a process that's a Nashville next level of engagement, just because that's probably not where um, the constituents uh, want to, to meet us and see us. So I, I will tell you clearly in the resilience work, water and how we manage it is going to be a critical part. And uh, we'll be discussing these issues, um, not specifically this, the, this actual proposal and plan, because you all haven't approved it. Um, but we will be engaging people on what those issues are in their communities. And, and that's uh, that we can share with you. I appreciate those details um, and gives me a couple follow-up questions. So, I mean, this is one of the things I'm driving at, Mr. Cole, is a couple years ago, the budget process, we specifically did not approve it. We specifically took it out of the CIB and community-wide engagement was left in. And so the idea then was community-wide engagement before a plan was approved. And I'm assuming that's still the uh, sequencing now. And, and then the other That's thing, the other thing um, that I'm sure is on y'all's mind is with a six billion dollar transit plan. Like, I mean, I mean, good luck getting a lot of people's attention on um, flood mitigation during that. And I, my my hope, I think everybody in the room, as important as the flood management is, I hope everybody in the room is going to. Um, put the A energy into the transit conversation, you know, between now and May. And, um, and so the, that was a statement. The question is that what you describe for a process, like what's, what's the time frame that you're imagining for that engagement? Well, I mean, there's, there's two things. We have a deadline for a resilience strategy that's due in probably September of 18. And so we're going to be doing a deep dive in the next three months on that work. I mean, I, I think what we're talking about with the CIB and this proposal is uh, certainly that y'all have a comfort level in May when that comes back. So um, this is a this is a you know this will be a, a a key thing, you know, from a mayoral perspective and from a perspective of how we look at these issues. I mean, transportation, our ability to move around, our ability to respond from a, a God forbid a Maria or Irma type event. I mean. Those are both resilience challenges. I mean, those are those are what 21st centuries have to 21st century cities have to do is we have to deal with all those challenges at once. So I think we can do that and engage the community on all of them. All right, thanks. And Scott, do you mind going back to the slide with the heat maps from before Harvey and after Harvey? Because I, I I I think I understand Councilman Mendez's point is. Um, you know, it seems somewhat limited in the sense of only going to meetings that council members call you out to. Um, but I know some of this, f these flooding issues, and I know, like, for instance, for this map, for the stormwater issues are, you know, after we, after Harvey came through, I know I sent several projects to Tom Palco of, hey, here's our, some things that I've heard about, I'm sure, think, um, folks in, in their own requests, but it's somewhat, not necessarily reactionary, but things when things pop up, that's when it gets on your radar for the you know the different level projects. So it's it has to be, I think, at least partially somewhat led by the district council member because we know where the problems are in such and such a road or between you know John and Jane's property line and the or the creek that runs behind them or something like that. And so I think this is a good. Once Harvey came through, we had a lot of you know flooding incidents or stormwater runoff incidents that were new. They got put on the the list to to get uh you know get done because that's what that map is is that correct yeah that's correct um one of the things that when we had the unified flood preparedness plan community meetings in um, 2011 and 2012 we had i bet we had at least 12 community-wide um, meetings and most of the time, the metro people outnumbered the citizens. And um, 
So we had a really difficult time getting people engaged. So that's why I'm hoping to go directly to y'all to get in your normal district meetings so we can, you know, number one, be on an agenda. And that, that way we can be part of your meeting and, um, and not just be having a meeting as an example at um, the Bordeaux Library where we had, you know, maybe you know, five people. So it's, uh, it's difficult for us to, to get the engagement that we would hope to get sometimes. So that's why we want to come to y'all directly. Councilman Hagar. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Potter, uh, Mr. Cole, for attending today. Um, I'll say this, you know, since we've increased the stormwater charges, I've seen more activity, and I appreciate that in my area. I want to go back to this flood wall again because I've been through it before. As I understand, the downtown area is, that's a 500-year floodplain. Am I correct? Um, it's two feet above the flood of record, so I don't know what the 500-year what right. what what that's going to be characterized as? Right. It's two feet above flood record. And the the flood wall only protects what is it? Uh, one square mile or a half a square mile? Is that correct? I can get you the exact footprint, but I don't know the exact. But that's about the area that it covers, correct? I'll get you. I don't know. I'll get you the the exact footprint. Right. And the last time we had this issue come up before, I asked about federal funding, and I know I'd done my research, Louisville and St. Louis and some other cities that got federal funding. And the last time we were here, you indicated that uh, there might be federal funding available. Have we done any work on that since then? Well, when you do a, a, a proposal to the court, it's, um, it's very involved. And I've got a memo here that goes into great detail that what's required, I'll, I'll touch on the high points just to kind of give you an idea. So step one is what the federal, what the Corps would call the reconnaissance phase. And that is a, it's a fully federal funded activity and they, the quote is to determine if there is federal interest in pursuing a feasibility study. So the reconnaissance phase identifies if the Corps wants to even engage in a feasibility study. So that could take a year or, or, or so. So then you step into the feasibility phase, which is the study phase, and that's when that's 50-50 federal, non-federal, so we would be on the hook for 50% of the funding, and that would essentially start the planning process to identify what should be designed. So once that has to, that has to be approved all the way up to chain of command through Cincinnati and through Washington, D.C., once that's approved, then you go into design and construction and that's 6535. So from my perspective, if we start that process, we're talking years. And I don't see a very strong likelihood of getting the funding because the Corps has so many backlog projects within our state that I just don't think we're gonna get any federal participation. And okay, well, let me ask you this. I mean, we voted on this back in 2015, is that correct? You voted on, on flood what? wall back then. Yes. Okay. And so nobody's ever tried to even start this process to try to get federal funding. No. I mean, we're talking about two years ago. I can start it, but I just don't think we're going to get um, to be successful, Councilman. And that's uh, that's not a guess. That's a pretty strong probability. But we'll bring we'll bring the process. Well, forward. you don't know until you try. That's right. A good point. That's try. A good point. You know, I mean. It'd be easier for the public to swallow that. Okay. All right. And then, as I understand this flood wall, it's about $130 million right now to build it? It's 125 was the last um, the number, right. but I don't feel comfortable in, in saying that's consistent right. with the uh, construction environment that we're in right now. And then the maintenance cost is about a half a million a year, correct? It's not going to be that much. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's 500000 not that much, but it won't be significant because we're just looking at maintenance of the pump station and um, maintenance on the valve. So it won't be, um, I don't think it'll be even half a million dollars when it comes down to actuality. Well, the last time we were here was 300,000 a year, so I know it's gonna be more than that, correct? I just don't think so, because it's a lot of money just for maintenance on the pumps. That's what your engineers said the last time, whoever it was, Barge and Wagner or whoever. I remember, I got a good memory. And then as I understand this particular flood wall, 
still takes eight hours to put up. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And we talked about that before. Um, as you know, the last time that we flooded, I was the one standing at Second and Broad when the police officer told me to back up because they're getting ready to open the floodgates. And 30 minutes later, it came up Broadway all the way to Sixth Avenue. Now, I've asked you that before. What makes you think that the Corps is going to wait for you to put these walls up? Because we're going to be ahead of the problem, Councilman. And how are you going to do that? We're going to put that wall up as soon as we get any kind of indication of an event of the nature of May 2010. Now, as I understand, most of businesses downtown have flood insurance, or do you know? I don't know. All right. Are you also aware that a lot of businesses downtown have moved their mechanical rooms and things of that nature upstairs? I've been appraised of that, yes, but I'm not okay. sure who has and who has not. Has there been any approach to any of the businesses down there to help pay for this? I have not. Okay. Um, have you looked at the flood wall that Opryland put up? Yes. Why can not something like that similar be put up? Because they put theirs up for a lot less than $130 million. They uh, they had an existing levy that they put up, I think, in the in the 70s, and the the levy was increased. Shannon, how how high did it go up from the 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 overflow point of the levy went up x number of feet? I'll get the exact number, um, but and they have a pump station, so it's not as extensive as what we would have to do. They don't have the, the closures of the two stormwater tunnels. They don't have the closures of the First Avenue tunnel. So there's going to be a pretty dramatic difference in the amount of water that has to be um, pumped. So they're similar, but ours is a whole lot more extensive. Well, just to make a comment, you know, I live on the lake. You said you lived up there, too. And a while back when we had the heavier rains, some of the marinas were complaining that the Corps had let the lake level down. That was in contemplation of some of the heavy rains like Harvey and them coming through. So I'm looking at it from that standpoint, and I still say, like I said before, because I had a relative that worked for the Corps, that that was total miscommunications when Owickery Dam didn't open up their locks earlier. And as you're well aware, the Opry Land, when Opry Mills, and then when they sued the Corps, the reason they lost that suit is because it was the discretionary function of government to open those locks, and as such, they had complete immunity, and then the Corps admitted afterwards that they did mess up and didn't open up the locks early enough. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. Okay. So I'm just letting you know I'm well aware now that the Corps is watching the levels of that lake very closely. They are. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows, and I think I recall this was in the 500-year floodplain, the downtown area. I mean, I can get that to you, Councilman. I just don't okay. know the top of my head. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Yes, sir. Council Lady Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Potter. Um, I will reserve all the flood water, uh, flood wall question because I'm so excited. You have finally designs down and models uh, tested. So I reserve all this question until I have a November demonstration. And my question is uh, the community engagement part. Uh, you stated you know, each area has uniquely different uh, flood damage. And as you know, my area, uh, West Mead, uh, Hillwood, uh, Warner Park community, and we, our problem is more so uh, water runoff. And particularly uh, Warner Park area, I am so grateful because you are a guys, you know, water department are working so hard. And especially I am so grateful about the clean water project on the Davidson and Brick Hollow. Yes, and right now there's uh, storm water and runoff was uh, separated. So the water naturally act like the way it's supposed to. So my question is, uh, because especially uh, the resident of Warner Park area near the uh, Bones Gap with, you know, Richland Creek, mm -hmm. uh, they are not, um, um, the major problem is when uh, rain, uh, the runoff coming from the hill. So in that sense, you know, I would like to have invite you over and then talk about how we can mitigate uh, those runoff water 
And I can guarantee you I can have at least 50 to 70 people come to the meeting. We'll be there. <laughs> and my question, before I get too excited, uh, we are imagining like a you know big, like a gigantic French drain in between the large park and those community. We those uh, you know engineering will be possible to mitigate, uh, especially in that uh, particular section. Well, uh, Council Lady, one thing I always say as an engineer, we can do that, um, but we need to look at the unique situation. In, in that neighborhood and identify the best solution. So I think step one is that we get together with your constituents, we take a look at the problem, and we identify how best to approach it. I appreciate that. I look forward to the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair. I think 95% of my questions have already been answered. That's what happens when you get in the queue uh, later. So thank you. Um, I guess... Uh, my question builds off some of the things that Councilman Hager said. I think when my constituents bring this matter up, whether that was you know two years ago during the campaign or now, mm -hmm. the elephant in the room is always that downtown would not have flooded if not for the Corps' inappropriate you know release or tracking that and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, without disparaging the core I mean how do, how do you all speak to that because I think if you go out and you do this community engagement and you go if, if you don't respond to that elephant like this conversation is not going to advance I so. understand Council Lady and that's a difficult question um, one thing I can I'll, I'll tell you about what I do know and what we've done um, prior to May 2010 as an example I didn't have the personal phone number of the colonel in charge of the district downtown. I do have that now. The communications between the Corps of Engineers and Metro Water Services is 100% better than it was before May 2010. The communication between the National Weather Service and Metro Water Services and the Corps is better than it's ever been. So starting from, like the council, Councilman Hager said, the Corps communicates with us greatly on the conditions of the river and what they're doing to manage it all the time. In, the, in Harvey, the CO, um, the colonel in charge of the, of the district, the Nashville district, he was emailing the mayor and me every day saying what they're going to do, what they anticipated risks were, and what they would do in the, in the event of a worsening situation. So we know now what's going to happen much better than we did before May 2010. The Corps, their modelers and their operators are the best in the world at what they do. Um, May 2010, clearly a lot of things went wrong. But from my perspective, I'm not, I'm not going to try to either defend the Corps or attack the Corps. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what we're going to do and what we're gonna propose and I can say with a lot of assurance that since we are communicating better with the Corps and with the Weather Service and we have the SAFE program especially, I think we have a very a extraordinarily better handle on how the Cumberland is going to perform as well as the TRIBS. So I'm not going to use the word disparage. I don't think that's either going to serve a purpose for us because going forward, I think what we've done in the county from a stormwater management perspective, what we intend to do speaks to how we're working to not have it happen again. So I think that's the approach I would take. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, that sounds like a massive improvement and it's good to hear. I think it's great for our constituents to hear that that communication is happening. But at some level, that then circles back to then why do you need the flood wall? Right. I mean, if you've improved that communication, if you've mm -hmm. got all these systems in place, if you're tracking it so closely, why do you need? Right. And I guess the one other thing that I would ask that, you know, you're saying the Corps is in support of this project, but they don't technically approve it because it's not within the navigable waterway. But by the same token, you all, through your design and engineering, moved this project outside of that footprint so as to avoid the needed approval. 
And I wonder if you could speak to why you did that. You just summarized it. Um, that way we didn't have to go into the permitting process with the core on the, on, on the pump station. Why would you want to avoid that? Just because it's difficult, you know, and it's not necessary. If we can move it, if we can move the footprint out of the Navajo waterway, then we don't have to deal with that. Right, but can you see how from the public's perspective in the spirit of all that new dialogue and working together that you're having, trying to move that outside well, of that when seems I say, to look like you're trying to dodge something? That, that makes sense, but let me explain what move men, means. Instead of having the, the pump station oriented this way, we oriented it that way. We, so didn't, we didn't move it from Rather here. than into the... Yeah, navigable, you have it here. laterally. We just took the, the pump station and rotated it a little bit. So we didn't do anything dramatic. It was just, you know, we, we could do that, so we did. And it made sense. Okay, and then lastly, um, in response to Councilman Hager, you had stated that you felt uh, confident that if in pursuing the federal funding that we would not be successful. And earlier, I guess you contextualized that with Harvey, Maria, Puerto Rico, et cetera. Okay. But I'm wondering, to Councilman Hager's point, council didn't vote for this in 2015. So if this was already designed at that juncture, why did you not pursue that process just from a good stewardship standpoint? Again, that's what my constituents are gonna ask okay. me. Why didn't you pursue that? Fair enough. Um, we'll initiate that. But one thing that I'll point out, when I was talking about Harvey and Puerto Rico and Houston, I was speaking of FEMA and TEMA money, and then from the core, their funding source is completely different. Okay, I appreciate so you clarifying there's, that. There's two different revenue streams, but um, you know we'll engage with the core and um, start that process. It's, uh, I'm just not very hopeful but I will start. Okay, I appreciate that. And I mean, we trust you in that regard, but again, from our constituents' perspective. I totally today, get it. Okay, thank I mean, you. That's, that's an excellent point, and you're absolutely right. And Councilman Hager, you're right as well. Thank you. And Mr. Part, I guess the I guess the timeline that you mentioned as far as you know the approval process, and then you also mentioned the backlog of projects that they have. You know, if that might be illustrative of you know, how long it would take and, and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, that, um, that goes back to the council lady's question that I'm really not comfortable speaking on the Corps' behalf. So I can't speak at all to how they operated the dams during May 2010. And I really can't speak to um, their choices in pursuing um, funding. But I do know that I've been director of Metro Water for almost 17 years now, and the Corps has told me over and over and over that getting funding through them on projects of this scale is highly unlikely. And they always, and I use the word always because they always do it, they bring up the locks on the Chickamauga locks um, in Chattanooga and how they have a considerable amount of repair work to do um, there and they haven't obtain that funding. So that speaks to me that they have um, priorities other than engaging in building a flood protection system for Nashville. With that being said, I'm gonna start the process and I'm going to uh, seek that funding. I appreciate that. I just think, you know, they have to look at it on the spectrum as well, right? So yes, if that says something to Nashville, if they believe that the lock repair at Chickamauga is more acute than us building the flood wall, right? That, They're that making sense. a judgment based on, I would hope, the likelihood of an acute or catastrophic event. So um, I think that just puts things into perspective I understand. as well. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Chair. I had to uh, had a nice conversation with Councilman Hager, remind him that uh, Director Potter was not on a witness stand being cross-examined, so. Um, I would, the Councilman Hager, he, I've noticed, every time he questions anybody. It's part of the fun, anybody, you know, I, I get some, that. It's part of the fun. Sometimes well, even if they're friendly, I mean, it's he is addressing them as if he's, count, you know, uh, no, no doubt about it, and the problem is he thinks he already knows the answer. Remember what lawyers yeah. think. 
That's it. Um, one thing I want to... I'm just glad to be here. I just want to point out to, uh, which I have been with Councilman Hager and I have been discussing, and Council Lady, Lady Henderson just brought up, um, this seeking out federal funding. We need to remember that in 2016, we, as a body, says, said no more. Give the, thir the million, 13 million, I believe it was, for, for um, uh, community, um, what was it? Uh, well, but, but no more researching, no more investigating the, um, the downtown flood wall. So, I mean, I'm gonna speak on your behalf. You followed this body's request. So, um, and even so, I think if there were, I mean, I've never seen any advertisements from it, from the Corps saying we have, we have uh, grants available for <laughs> flood walls or, or for preventing I, I flood, you know, flooding in downtown. So it's not like they're, it, not like we're seeking funding for um, uh, all the grant or, or seeking funding for things where we receive grants from on, that we as a body approve on a bi-monthly basis or bi-weekly basis. So uh, um, I think Councilman Hagar and I will continue to argue the point about when court's in session and when not, but thank you. I think he's a spectacular lawyer. Mm -hmm. If I ever get like in trouble, he's my man. <laughs> Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Councilman Elrod. I want to respond to what uh, Councilman Pridemore said, if I may. Um, you know, my recollection of when uh, Director Potter was here and we were talking about, you know, pulling that flood wall out of the budget and talking about community engagement, I think I specifically said, Director Potter, I don't feel that you've made the case for this wall. And it wasn't so much about, you know, checking all the boxes to go to the different community meetings, but, you know, excellent presentation. I appreciate the context very much, but again, as to the specific you know, engineering need for this flood wall. It seems that this presentation, the dialogue about this, always starts from the assumption that we need this. And then you back into it that way. What I'm asking you is to daylight and show the public you know, the engineering that says to you, to your staff, that, that this is crucial um, and, you know, Get all that out there. That needs to be part from a resiliency perspective, from a public engagement standpoint. Um, I think that's what we wanted um, to see. In addition to having those conversations with the community, um, excellent presentation, but as well, you know, again, it comes from a place of y'all have decided that you need it, and this is giving the context of why we need it, but not really getting down to that engineering level of and again, going back to the elephant in the room that I spoke to. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you need to just go a little deeper on that and yes, then, okay, thank you. One, one thing that we need to re be reminded of, if 19 inches of rain fall out of the sky, like it did in May 2010, we're gonna get a really similar reaction to the watershed. So it's... Um, and that's, that's what people want to hear. They want to understand that you and your engineers think if 19 inches fall out of the sky tomorrow that downtown will flood again. And there are not enough people convinced that, that is a fact. Okay. I'm just putting it out there. And I actually think that's a great advertisement. I mean, Scott, you know, has said and is going to set up more in-depth meetings at, at MWS that some of us didn't know if y'all would be interested in. Clearly, you are, and that's great. So I think that they want to talk about the engineering and, and, and discuss it. I think on these larger issues of both funding, but also our challenges overall, this night has been a great advertisement for why we need a resilient strategy and an analysis of what our shocks and stresses are and where we could get a roadmap for funding these things in some unique and in, in, in uh, innovative ways going forward. So this is, I mean, this has been a really good dialogue in that regard because uh, it's not just flooding, it's all kinds of issues um, as a community that you guys see face-to-face. Uh, -face. So you've, you've made my night. I have one, I have one question, Council Lady. Um, I'll, I'll need your help on this. As an engineer, we see a problem and 
we develop a solution to the problem. So you're, you're telling me that what I see as the problem needs to be educated to the public that the problem still exists? Indeed. That, that is the problem. Not enough of our community concurs, understands, believes that the problem, because most people, and I mean my constituents who have asked me about this, believe that downtown would not have flooded if not for the issue at the dam. And going forward, based on improvements and knowledge of what that, uh, that downtown will not flood again. Okay. I, so, my we, answer to that is yikes. And that's okay, gonna be, exactly. You know. And that, that's the point I'm making to you. You all are operating from an assumption that you know from your engineering and your modeling and everything that we will flood again. And that's why this is an acute need. And oh my goodness, why doesn't the community and the council understand that we've got to build this wall? Okay. It's a system, please. System. I apologize. Right. <laughs> um, but again, I'm just speaking with the voice of the community. I totally okay? hear you. Okay. So I, I totally um, get it. Yeah, do daylight that engineering. What are the assumptions that you've made? What are the models? What is the, you know, all that. Okay. People have an appetite for the technical knowledge about this that shows you that this is necess a necessary investment. I understand. Thank and you. I, pr I, I really appreciate that feedback. Thanks. That's awesome. And I think also as part of as part of the the term, you know, 100 year flood, 500 year flood. I think you referenced earlier. As people think, oh, it's in the 500 year floodplain, so we're not going to have another one for 500 years. But that's just really a probability that's even today now outdated and based upon assumptions of what happened the previous 50 years, even before this. But now we're seeing more regular weather events. So I think that's also going to part of. Uh, Folks think that since it's already happened in 2010, we're not going to see it for at least decades, if not hundreds of years. Can I make a quick attempt at, at answering your question, Council Lady? I, I'm not going to go into huge detail, but I want to kind of get, I want to talk a little bit and then see what you think. And you got to start, <clears throat> you got to start at Cheatham Dam. Okay, that's the, the dam on the Cumberland River that exits the county. And when I talked about the watershed extending into Kentucky, if a drop of water lands in that watershed, it's going to that point. It's going to Cheatham Dam. So as Cheatham Dam rises, then the ability of water to flow downstream from here retards, okay? And if you think about Harpeth River, more water fell from a, a relative basis more water fell in the Harpeth watershed than in most of the other watersheds. So the Harpeth River rose extraordinarily high as well. So you, what you have is the creation of a hydraulic dam. So the water can't flow because you don't have, you don't have, um, you don't have the, the, the hydraulic grade for the water to go downhill essentially. So the grade line starts here, and it doesn't change shape. It keeps going up, okay? Because the pointy end at Cheatham Dam, that goes up, up, up. So there's no way for the water to get from downtown to Cheatham Dam because Cheatham Dam is way up here. So there's, there's no magic way for us to get rid of that water other than it flows out of the county, unfortunately, to Clarksville, and they got hammered as well. So if 19 inches of rain falls out of the sky on those watersheds, the same amount of water is going to try to get to the same spot. And what we have presently won't change anything at all because the same hydraulics are going to reestablish as occurred in May 2010. Does that make sense? Somewhat. Okay. I'd have to, I mean, again, like I'd probably need to see some visuals, might okay. need to think about kind of how that's described, but I'm, yes, that's helpful. Would you be yeah. a one-person focus group for us? <laughs> I'd be happy to, and if any of my colleagues would want to join That'd me as well. That'd be great, because, yeah. you know, engineers, we can fix a lot of stuff, but every once in a while we have a little bit of problem communicating it, so um, maybe, maybe we can get some help on that. Happy to help. Thank you. Thanks.
I think Council Leader Van Rees is volunteering to. Um, Councilman Bedney. Sorry, I'm chewing almonds. <laughs> so Argentina is playing the qualifying right now, and I'm here instead of watching the game that is going to decide if they go to the World Cup or not. So that shows you how important They're up 2-1 right Who's now. Who's playing? Argentina against Ecuador. Who are you for? <laughs> the U.S. Well um, said. So, Eric, this is something that I had the impression during this conversation, that the community engagement is not exactly the way I thought it was going to be when I proposed doing that when we talked before. For me, the community engagement is not a one-way street where we go and tell people what we're going to do and hope that they will endorse it. Like he said before, engineers can do anything if you throw enough money at it. Uh, so I think we need to be mindful that as we talk to people, they're going to have feedback and we have to be ready to accommodate their feedback. Otherwise, it's just a selling tour uh, around the county. So I just wanted to make that point that we keep that in mind as we go out into the community. Yeah. Uh, that's a, I mean, that's a fantastic point. I think that's why you didn't see us come with kind of a slick, you know, here's, you know, we're going to do a series of meetings and PSAs and advertisement. Um, again, we need that feedback. I think part of, you know, I, I'm relatively new to this discussion. And so when Scott and the team kind of showed me the breadth of the work that's happened countywide, I mean, part of what we wanted to do was just reflect to you all the work that has happened because it's dramatic and you all have funded it and it's impressive. Um, but we also do need to solicit from, again, your constituents, their specific concerns, again, around stormwater, but also around other, um, you know, other infrastructure challenges that we've got um, as a city. Um, and so uh, I think that's uh, exactly what we intend to do. Um, you know, but we want y'all's help in, again, being our focus groups, but also interviewing you all, at least I'm going to do that for the resilience work, but, you know, let you tell us what the best way is to engage with your constituents, and then we'll go about doing that work. And that was the exact source of my frustration with Councilman Mendez. I didn't understand how else I could answer the question other than I'm going to come to your to your districts. I mean, that's what we're going to do. So other than that, I don't know what else we can say. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come to y'all and we're going to listen. And I think uh, something that Council, um, Councilman Bedney is getting at is, you know, sometimes we have community meetings and it's, hey, this is what we're going to do. And that's it. But you're looking more to, hey, this is what we're planning, this is what a plan that we have, but also what is, this is what is going on in your district, and this is what we have planned for your district and, and in other areas. And I think part of it is the lecture style that are at a lot of community meetings, and I've been to a couple of community meetings that, that, I, that I've been to for some, that somebody else was. They were, you know, stations where, you know, there were folks like for the 8th Avenue discussion of showing actual maps, and there was, you know, immediate feedback instead of the lecture style of somebody at the front, and then question and answers back and forth, but a lot more, discussion among participants instead of that there's a speaker and then there's a question so i couldn't agree more councilman that's that's how we do our meetings at metro water generally speaking we don't talk at people we want to listen so uh, just a couple of points to wrap up one um would be uh, to uh, i appreciate you uh, looking at the core funding um but i think we don't want to lose sight that you know houston you know they had a dramatic rainfall event but they also didn't invest in their flood locally, their flood uh, preparedness, and that resulted in some of the flooding that that was down there. So it's, I think it's somewhat like transit. While we, you know, you go after every federal and state dollar that you can, but eventually it comes to local investment and local dollars, um, and that goes into um, the home buyouts. I don't want that to get lost in the discussion. Is is the best way to to essentially permanently, as far as the next several decades, to take care of a place that floods is to give fair market value to all the folks that live in that area, so they can buy a home somewhere else where they're safe and where there's not you know emergency personnel that are rescuing people from home 
homes in the middle of the night. Um, so I, I don't want that to get lost. And that's, you know, y'all have been chasing federal dollars on that, but that I think would also need more local investment um, as well. Um, and also, we had we actually had a quorum of the Public Works Committee here tonight. So I think that shows the level of detail that the committee and other council members are willing to get into um, on this. So I think the engineering meetings, informational meetings for council members, you know, get into not just the downtown system, but also, you know, go into the assumptions of the need for the downtown wall, you know, what, like what you were talking about, Cheatham Dam, you know, and that kind of thing, um, of why the water will back up, and if there's 19 inches, that water has got to be behind that dam, and therefore it's going to be here. So, um, unless there's any other questions, um, all right, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you all. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.